Welcome to Spinning Back Click, where each week here at MMA Junkie, we take a spin through the biggest stories in MMA. On today's episode, Max Holloway delivers one of the greatest KOs ever and wins the BMF title. Was that the best finish in UFC history? Alex Pajeda's first title offense is in the books. A vicious left hook and some nasty ground and pound gets the job done. Kayla Harrison had one heck of a UFC debut should she fight for the title next big questions we're going to tackle them hello everyone gorgeous george here on the con and look at the distinguished panel we have for you today we got goes from mma junkie radio he's in las vegas danny segura host of hablemos mma he's in miami mike bond aka alley-oop he's in toronto Cold coffee will be on the ones and twos, but before we get started, if you would kindly tap that like button, I'm going to do it as I speak, like right now, I'd greatly appreciate it. Let's get going, guys. We had two undisputed title fights, one hell of a BMF title fight, a successful UFC debut by a high-profile free agent. Of the 13 fights, we had eight finishes. We had a UFC Hall of Fame announcement, $1.2 in bonuses. A $16 million gate, 20,000 in attendance. Did it live up to UFC 300 expectations? Mike Vaughn, you were in attendance. You get the first take. Hell yeah, it did. I mean, what a show this was, right? Like, what more could you really ask for from this? Um, maybe, like, if Zhang Wali versus Yan Xiaonan did end in the first round there, that would have been, like, the only little bit there. But other than that, you know, that's being, like, super, super picky. That was a good fight. Uh, I think we got some like drama that maybe we weren't expecting after seeing how that first round went. But yeah, man, like being cage side, that was one of the more memorable shows. Um, you still got digested a little bit as we'll kind of talk through here today. But yeah, immediate impressions like that one really stood out um, going in. I know some people maybe didn't think this was the card that Dana White touted it out to be originally, but the way it played out in terms of action, excitement, moments, all that stuff, like you got to give it an A to A plus in my mind. Mm -hmm. All right. Goes. Was it the greatest event in UFC history? I think so, man. You know, uh, the way they set it up, it's hard for it not to be. You know, there's just so many options. It's not like boxing where you go, there's one fight. If it doesn't deliver, that's it. Uh, we had so many great fights that could have probably headlined their own show. The way things went down, just those historic moments, like Mike was saying with Gagey Holloway. I think it does. I mean, it definitely, at the very least, goes down on a Mount Rushmore of ever when you throw in prides and all that. But yeah, I mean... For me, it was two ninety or sorry, one ninety nine for a long time. I think this one got it. Wow. Well, you were at one ninety nine, so uh, yeah, I remember that one. That was uh, Henderson and Lombard, Rockhold and Bisping, right? I think, mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and then the big Faber Brock Lesnar announcement. I think Faber and Cruz. I had a lot of yeah. them. Strickland yeah. was on two, the two seventeen is the other one. Max Holloway, yeah. Ricardo Lamas. That's where the original. Yeah. Let's throw oh. down happened. Good call. What were you saying, Mike? 217 is, is another 217 one. 217 was the big one, the you know, the one at Madison Square Garden where we had the three title changes, still the only night in UFC history where three new champions were crowned, you know, with GSP, Bisbing, Garbrandt, Dillashaw, and Joanna mm -hmm. and Rose. That one really, really stands out. But uh this was very much up there. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Danny Segura, who was the biggest winner of the night? Uh, and if it's Max, then just give me your number two. But maybe it wasn't Max. You tell me. I mean, there's only one right answer here. It's Max Holloway. I mean, the, the guy, first of all, he felt like the main event. Like him and Gagey felt like the main event this entire week. All respect to the other two undisputed title fights that we saw in the main and co-main. But I feel like all the fans from an actions point, uh, action point were excited for this one more than any other fight. One has the BMF allure and two, like because it has the BMF allure, like it had to have these two guys that just throw down at any given moment that have super exciting fights, bonuses back to back. Uh, this was it. This was the crown jewel. And, and it felt like the main event, to be honest. So, um, yeah, Max Holloway won the fight, won the night. And honestly, he you can maybe argue and, and say that he might be the best position fighter right now in 2024. Like, I don't know. I can't Absolutely. think of anybody at the top of my head that's in a better position. Mm -hmm. Maybe McGregor, right? Just because he's a superstar and he's got so much leverage. But really, if you talk about like options and, and availability, like 
Max Holloway is holding all the cards. He's got two divisions he can play around with, and I don't think a lot of people would complain if he stays at 155 or goes down to 145. On top of that, shout out to, to Mike. Uh, he got a hefty uh, a bonus there, 600K for performance of the night and fight of the night, courtesy of, of Mike Bong, who uh, allegedly did not take any cuts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, all in all, it's just a great night for Max Holloway. I mean, it is good to be Max Holloway. And I said this on Twitter, and, and it kind of, um, you know, um, I feel like a lot of people um, uh, kind of li like the the spirit of, of the comment, but it's like you we kind of thought Max Holloway was who he was, right? Like we just kind of thought he was who he was this entire time, right? The second best featherweight out there behind Volkanovski, and that just kind of lingered for a long time. Now it's like the ceiling has been broken and there's a new ceiling and we don't know where that is. So there, there's only one correct answer here, George. Sorry for the rant. It is Max Blessed Holloway. All right. Who was your number two, Danny? <laughs> um, Pereira. I would say Pereira. I mean, Poatan, incredible run, what he's been doing in MMA and just in 12 professional fights. Uh, that Jamal Hill was, knockout was brutal. Um, and dude, he's a superstar. It's, it's crazy. He's been in the UFC for such a little time and, and he's become one of the most, um, he's almost become like a Nick Diaz, Nate Diaz type of fighter. Like he's developed a cult following win or lose. I think people are gonna, gonna be Poatan fans forever. Goes and Danny, you guys both watched it on television. Mike was there, so we can tell from his voice alone, he's still buzzing over the event. How about for you guys? Did it live up to your expectations? Goes, go first. Uh, did the card? Yeah, 300 from, you know, I guess what we anticipated now that it took place. Did it live up to the expectations of what everyone wanted? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, look, going in, we had a lot of questions, right? Things just didn't really add up the way we thought they would. But overall, look, what we ended up with was amazing. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people that were in the building, different parts of the arena, you know, cage side, up at the top as high as you can go. Everybody walked out of there with a smile on their face leading up the weigh-ins. The, the press conference was a lot of fun. But you know what? Like, honestly, Mike Mike deserves a lot of credit because I feel like the second that was put out there into the universe, I feel like it just kind of gave an injection into these fighters and a different level came out of them. Like, you know, as Danny said, uh, and I was there, Holloway and uh, Ricardo Lamas, he did do that there. But he hasn't done that in every fight. And a part of me thinks, hell, he probably probably wanted to do that even more with so much money on the line in a fight like that. Like, True. we could almost thank Mike for that moment. I mean, there, there's so many things that happened on this card. It was um, a big roller coaster, right? Ups and downs. There were times where even off of a win, I think Dana White said this, like after that Gagey Holloway, it did suck the air out of the crowd. Like we were tired. George and I were doing the watch along and we were absolutely exhausted going into the next fight. And the next fight was intriguing. It was fun, but it's rare that cards do this to you. And so I thought overall, man, for as much crap at times that we did give the situation, uh, I have to eat crow. I think this was a tremendous card. Danny, how did it come off to you? I think it's the greatest card I've ever seen uh, for a long time. For me, um, it was UFC 205 with McGregor uh, getting uh, the second title against um, Eddie Alvarez. And we had freaking Habib in the preliminary card. I mean, it was just a crazy card. That for me was the best card the UFC has ever put together. Uh, but this topped it. And I understand um, it got a lot of hate. And look, I was one of the critics saying like, hey, ah, Alex Pereira, Jamal Hill headlining UFC 300. Right. Where's Connor? Where's Masvidal? Where's Nate Diaz? Like we needed something bigger. But I'm almost kind of glad that it played out the way it did because um, it kind of served both sectors of the fan base. Like the casuals were absolutely uh, in love with the action as well. And the hardcore is like, we, we got legitimate fights here. Like we got like one of the best fighters pound for pound today, Alex Pereira, to headline this thing, right? Uh, all respect to Conor McGregor, who's a huge star, right? right? But like MMA wise, like how relevant is he now in, in terms of like the world's best? Um, so... I think this is the greatest card that UFC has put together from top to bottom. It was just super interesting. Sometimes, you know, and, and I'm guilty of this. I'll admit it. Like, um, you know, these UFC Apex uh, uh, cards, sometimes you doze off a little bit. The fights get a little a little boring. There's a lot of fighters with with uh, not many big names, this and that. But literally from the start, we had Figueredo and Garbrandt going at it. Two mm -hmm. former champions, super important mm -hmm. fight for the division. I mean, it just felt like you couldn't miss it. Literally, there was a few times I had to run to the kitchen, run to the bathroom. I was sprinting. 
I was sprinting because I couldn't miss the action. So best card that UFC has put together uh, today. Very fitting for UFC 300. So um, yeah, man, I'm I'm over the moon. I don't need I don't even need this coffee. I'll put this down. I'm I'm still hyped from from all the action. I love it. All right, Mike. I heard nine thousand people were already in the building just for the first fight alone, which is more than a lot of UFC fight nights. It's more than some boxing events. Um, so the, the 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 tone was set early on. And like Go said, credit to you, you know, the press conference, you got Dana White to consider and, and then, um, you know, affirm the $300,000 uh, for the bonuses and Mark Coleman getting to put the belt around uh, the winner of the BMF. Is, is that about the time things started to really amp up over, over there in Vegas? At the press conference, I think, yeah, because you kind of got that first moment of like the crowd energy, right? And you got to see what this was like. You go in there and yeah, there was walking into the press conference, the queue outside at MGM Grand Garden Arena was like gigantic. One of the biggest I could remember um, rivals the Conor McGregor back in the day events where, you know, maybe not as an, of an animated of a crowd, like with the Irish fans who would just be absolutely nuts on those cards. But like the, the volume of people were there, the excitement was there. And then it kind of just kept going through the week. The ceremonial weigh-ins were solid as well. And then, yeah, it was an early arriving crowd for sure, man. Like you walk out into that big complex uh, there right outside T-Mobile arena and you're like, this is abnormal from when you're getting ready to walk over to an event at like 2 p.m. in the afternoon there. So, yeah, the, the people showed up rightfully so. I mean, those tickets weren't cheap. So uh, if you were going to go to that event, you should probably get your money's worth and go from the start. And most people did. And I think it reflected from the energy in the building all throughout the night. And man, it came across. And again, a lot of people don't realize this. That was really a big deal for you to bring that up. Mike had six assists this week. I don't know if anybody knows it. Four bonuses, the BMF belt getting wrapped by Mark Coleman, and P.F. Felator has some, some yeah. air to it. Even Dana White's putting it out there. So Mike went home with, with six dimes. I don't know how many points and rebounds he had. Yeah, well, he had I want to know who told said that word to Dana White. I, I need to know the backstory. And he was like, oh, that's, that's a good one. I'm going to drop that at the press conference tonight. Pia Felator. I love it, man. All right. Well, look, great reactions from everyone here on the panel. Chat room, you can participate if you're watching on YouTube and Facebook. We'd like to hear from you. What was your grade on it? Did you give it an A, or 1 through 10? Did you give it a 9 or a 10? What, what didn't you like, I guess, if you really have one complaint or a couple about the event? And if you have a question or comment, I'll be peeking at them and uh, trying to get the best ones on the show don't forget to hit that like button though that's all i ask here michael paul shout out to you thank you for uh the comment there and like i say i'll scroll and, and check out the questions um listen guys let's talk about max holloway i just can't wait to get to it we've kind of been brushing up on it right but let's dive in let's zero in what everyone's talking about here post fight max holloway's performance especially the spectacular finish of justin gagey up three to one going into round four basically on his way to four to a 4-1 decision, unanimous decision. And then with 10 seconds left, remember, Gagey had kind of uh, somersaulted forward trying to land a kick, right? And uh, and then uh, Holloway sidesteps it and then points because he hit. He hears the clapper, right, the 10-second clapper, and uh, he points to the, to the ground, and he says, let's get down. And I've watched it a few times, and I finally kind of see Gagey kind of nod like obliging, right? So Mad Max points to the center, digs his heels in, starts – Slinging the leather, Gagey obliges, wildly swings back, and with one second to go, whack, he gets knocked down, man. Gagey goes straight into the canvas. Mike Bond, what was that moment like? Absolutely insane. I mean, what more What more could you really describe it as? Like, that was pure Max Holloway uh, through and through, the kind of guy he's tried to prove himself to be over and over. But I just think the shocking factor is, right, is like, I know he knocked out Korean Zombie viciously in the last fight, but I think we all knew Korean Zombie past his expiration date in terms of being in his prime chin a little bit suspect at that point in his career. And he said that he knew he was losing badly and he had to go in there and brawl in order to try to make something happen. And Max caught him, but uh, we don't really think of him as this one punch KO guy. Right. And he mm -hmm. does that to Justin Gaethje, who is known as one of the most durable fighters in MMA history. And just to see Justin down face first on the canvas like that, he was out for a while, man. Like it was scary the way he went down there. 
Uh, so yeah, like just that moment, the utter shock of it was just unbelievable. I don't think everyone just expected that exchange to happen. They'd hug each other, celebrate, you know, the crowd would go wild, all that stuff. But for Justin to go down like that with one second left, I mean, what a shocking way for it all to end. Um, just an unbelievable knockout, an unbelievable highlight. That one will live on the reels in infamy forever. Uh, just a, a crazy, crazy KO. Look at all these shots. Um, beautiful camera work for the UFC. Some great shots of this knockout from cage side too. Um, just an all-time highlight, man. And for Max Holloway to just get it in that fashion in a fight, he was winning too. Like It's not like he was down and just trying to desperately make something happen here. He was the one that took the risk in this moment. So it was just all so perfect. The only thing that I think could have maybe like slightly topped it is if this was the main event, as Danny alluded to it being earlier. Like Imagine if this is how UFC 300 ended and that was the oh. end of the night with this highlight. But we obviously got you know Alex Pereira doing and his thing as well and a, a solid co-main event but yeah if this was the way the show closed that would have just been uh the only thing that could have maybe taken this to a slight other level but man just not enough good things you can say about max holloway we'll get into what this means going forward but in the moment this is one absolutely i'll never forget um just especially because the way the fight was going i mean another one that stands out to me being cage side was of course leon edwards coming back against kamaru uzman but that fight was slow by that point we all thought it was done and then like the shock factor of it coming out of nowhere this was all action all the way through and then just like the biggest stamp you could imagine right on the end Mike, Dana White asked at the press conference, who had Max Holloway winning? He didn't tell us how many hands went up. Maybe you can tell me. But that along with just talking to people, how big of an upset was this? I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, in the moment, like I, I picked him to win our staff picks. So I'm not going to sit here and like act like I thought he was a huge underdog going in there. I know a few other people on the staff picked him. There wasn't a ton of hands that went up. Um, mm -hmm. in fairness, when Dana asked that question, but yeah, I mean, I think Max Holloway winning, I don't think was like the biggest shocker in the world. And if he was going to win, I think you probably would have pre predicted it was going to be in the fashion that he did minus the knockout with one second left, right? Like he would have to outpoint him. He'd have to be elusive. He couldn't get hit with a huge shot and get knocked out himself. But like for him to win a kickboxing match with Justin Gaethje, who I don't think attempted a single takedown, like he allowed Max Holloway to do what he does absolutely best. So um, it doesn't shock me that he won and the fight played out that way. So yeah, I'm not going to sit here and call it a huge upset or anything like that. It was just a a virtuoso performance by Max Holloway, and the most shocking thing was just the, the end, that final second there. EJ Regal in the chat says, me. He says he predicted that Max Holloway was going to win. West Coast is hating a little bit. He says, did you forget Justin was gassed? Is why the KO happened with one punch. It was also on the money, and it was an, also an accumulative of the damage that was going down so i think it was about a 20 minutes there, with Justin's nose, gassed so. in every single fight look at the chandler one look at the poirier ones like like he literally fights you know just redlining the the engine the entire time so it's like no i think what mike said was was on the money and and i would like to add a weight class above yes he did it to the most durable guy yes he's not known for his power max holloway but he also did that a weight class above at 155 mm -hmm. where you think you know you'd lose power by going up dude spectacular performance by by max holloway he is the bmf for sure um i'll take back what i said uh last episode about uh, i'm not sure about he doesn't need to have a criminal record he can still go to the boys and girls club and still be the baddest <laughs> right. motherfucker. you did say that you did, did say that you but guys Danny, watching from i'm right? sorry george i'm just curious because um i don't think we can not talk about the eye pokes right like there was those two eye pokes did that mm -hmm. For you guys watching at home, obviously, you know, me being cage side, a little bit of a different experience, didn't hear the commentary or anything. Like, did that feel like a part of the narrative to any of you guys or, you know, playing you into know, the result? They happened early and he waved them off pretty quickly. So it didn't look like it impacted. I'm sure it did. We'd have to ask Justin that question. But it didn't look like uh, like as severe as other ones, you know. Um, the, bro the broken nose, though, if, if that's what it was, that definitely looked like uh it impacted a lot you know we obviously know the breathing um 
And that's 100 percent legit. On. I mean, you can't take yeah. that's all Max Holloway, you yeah. know, beautifully like scouting. Back and, and yeah, you see some weapon. of these highlights that come out. People are like, you know, putting together every time Justin dipped his head going in, Max threw that spinning kick. And uh, that seems like it was a brilliant part of the strategy from him and his team. So for him to crack him like that and mess up his nose at the end of the first round, that was obviously uh, all Max Holloway. So you can't take anything away. But I was curious about the eye pokes and think it needed to at least be mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. look, unless your name is Larry, Moe, and Curly, you can't take an eye poke like that. Like, it's going to affect you. But of all the ones that we've seen, um, he did kind of bounce back from it. I think it was more the nose that just really, really bothered him. But you have to ask yourself, how did it happen, right? Like, Max's timing in this fight was tremendous. His game plan was tremendous, and he stuck to it. He really did to just engage you what a lot of high-level athletes in that division have not been able to do. Um, it was an amazing performance all around from a guy who not that long ago, you guys, we had him in no man's land. Right. And look at yeah. his career now. Yeah, definitely has a lot of options. Um, and another thing, it, it was pretty cordial between both guys. Gaethje was quick to resume the action and they would fist bump and you could tell there wasn't any, um, you know, bad feelings at the time. Like, you know, Gaethje didn't didn't look at him in any way like you know hey man what's going on here i guess he just knew it was part of the game or whatever and i think both of these guys have built a clean reputation in the sport danny i want to ask you what does this do for max holloway's legacy like ghost pointed out he was in no man's land he was zero and three against the, what used to be the 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 current uh featherweight champ he's now the ex-champ and that's alex volkanovsky he's still young enough where it's no one was showing him the door right um, so what does this do about his legacy? How much did it change on Saturday night? I think it just added to the legend of, of Max Holloway. I don't necessarily think it changed the way we, we, um, like the way his like records and accolades change, right? He's still always gonna be like one of the greatest featherweights to ever exist, former featherweight champion. Um, but I do think this sets up a base for him to further that legacy, right? Like all of a sudden he's now BMF champion. All of a sudden, dude, he beat a top five guy at 155. And then he's probably still the sexiest fight for the champion at 145. Like he's got options here. And depending on how he plays his cards, I um, mean, also he looks spectacular. Let's not forget uh, that. Um, dude, he, he can completely reinvent whatever idea it is that we had of him. Uh, prior to UFC 300, like Go said, and like I mentioned earlier, um, before he kind of was in no man's land for some time, the second best featherweight out there, couldn't get past Volkanovski, 0-3 against him, um, you know, very, very beloved guy by the fan base, but that's about it, former champion, it seemed like he's still very good, but his better days, his, his, his time had passed, not anymore. Max Holloway is a super a superstar. Like uh, Mike mentioned as well, like this event was huge. I also wonder what this does to his stardom, right? Like he's always been kind of like a B plus star in the sense that uh, very well known, but still not like Nate Diaz, not Connor, not Masvidal. I, I wonder if this takes him there. We've seen that highlight play over and over and over again on social media, on ESPN, on the on the UFC's uh, social media accounts. Who knows what it does? And the sport's bigger than ever as well. So, like, who knows what Max Holloway becomes in the next few weeks, the next few months. That was a super badass moment. And uh, and he's got options now. Again, I feel like we I kind of had a ceiling for him now. And this performance completely destroyed it. And now he has uh, the runway to further his legacy much more. So, I think this just sets up the base for that. But, uh, yeah, iconic moment. This was the most Max Holloway moment in Max Holloway's career. Completely badass goes what would you advise max holloway to do next keep building and adding to that 155 frame and maybe await the winner of poye versus makashev you know he could possibly run interference there uh we'll talk about the 55 landscape it really shifted you know on saturday night mm -hmm. uh or is the topori fight just too much of a layup you know like the guy was cage side, and he's talking about even being the, the opposing team on the road and going to Spain. How would you advise? Yeah, man. I mean, that's the thing. I'm probably going to eat a lot of crow on this show because I was one of the guys that just didn't think Max Holloway was going to be Justin Gaethje, um, let alone have the performance that he had. He really can pick and choose what he wants to do next. And I felt at 155, I just I have the memory of him doing it the first time. It didn't look too well. This time you could tell he kind of addressed it differently. His body looked different. The way he fought was different. Uh, so he's shown that he can do big things at 155. This is a guy in Justin Gagey that a lot of people 
have had problems with, you know, it's hard to make him look bad for Max to do that. You're showing that you can do something at 155. But like George said, that's a layup, man. Tapuria, it's a great fight. Don't get it twisted, though. Tapuria is no joke. Yeah, he no, I don't do mean a, I don't mean that beating <laughs> Tapuria is a layup. I just mean it seems like it's there if he really wants right. it. You know, yeah. But see, Tapuria can do a lot of things that Volkanovsky did that gave Max trouble. So he's still going to have to address those things, figure out how to beat that style. There's a lot of speed there. Tapuria has a, an immense attack, right? Uh, the one thing that I would do, though, with everything that Max Holloway's been able to accomplish, and Danny used a great word, it's legend. He's got the title defenses, right? He, he's done all that. He's won belts. There's There's been a lot of champ champs in our history. What there isn't too much of is legend, and that knockout's going to live on and on. I feel like Max Holloway has a lot of cards to play, and one card that I would play that I know it gets thrown out there a lot, and Dana White somewhat addresses it, but look, man, we looked into that crowd and we saw a legend like BJ Penn sitting there. And it is a damn shame that everything that BJ did for this company, he never got to fight for the UFC in Hawaii. I don't want to see that happen again with another legend like Max Holloway. There's got to be a way to figure this out. Make that fight in Hawaii. That'd be tremendous. But if you don't and you can't, and chances are they probably can't, bro, I'm telling you, a fight in Spain is going to be absolutely bonkers. I don't want to hear Las Vegas. I don't want to hear Abu Dhabi, Saudi Arabia. I don't want to hear anything. But Spain or Hawaii, I think he's got to call that card. And I, I think you got to go back down to 145 because, like George said, man, it's a layup. Jesse James in the chat says, crazy that Max came out unscathed except his leg. And by the way, I don't think he was on crutches or anything. He was walking around fine. No, Brian I John in the saw chat. I saw him when I was leaving the, arena, or leaving the hotel yesterday. I was walking around totally fine. What did Jeez. it look like, Mike? Crazy. I, he, he was wearing pants, so I couldn't really see it, but he wasn't limping or anything like that. He said he was fine. Wow. Brian John does ask a question. Were they using the new UFC gloves for UFC 300? No, they will debut at UFC 302 on June 1st. Mike Bond, back to you. What's the future of the BMF title in your opinion? This was every, well, no, it wasn't every four years. The first one happened, and then four years later, the next one happened. So we went Mazadal Diaz. And then four years later, we had Poirier versus Gagey. But then less than a year later, we actually had a title defense. People called it a gimmick thing, right? But actually, this was probably the biggest pop at UFC 300. So what do you think happens going forward with this thing? Is, is Dana White warmed up to it where we could see it more often than not? Well, I don't know what you necessarily mean by that, but like he said, it's here to stay at the post-fight press conference, and he's getting asked, you know, is there going to be a female BMF, like all that stuff? Um, I guess it remains to be seen. I assume it would be on the line if Max Holloway fought Tapuria, uh, and mm -hmm. it would kind of like transition its way down there, but um, maybe not. I mean, we saw Masvidal and Usman fight, and it wasn't, you know, did go to Usman after. So it really depends what play they want to do with it but i assume knowing max hallway like he's gonna want to have that thing on the line just he you know personifies what this thing is all about so that's kind of my expectation that he he carries this around into a fight with tapuria maybe not and if he like loses he goes back to lightweight or something i don't know there's a lot of options here but i think it's definitely when it's convenient for the ufc and uh, whatever the case may be, they're, they're going to kind of throw it on there. I'm sure in a Taporia fight, they would love to have the poster of Taporia with his UFC belt against Holloway with his BMF belt. And I think Ilya did say to ESPN backstage that, you know, he is excited by the idea of having two belts. He's like, oh, I didn't even think like I want a second belt now. So I think that's exciting for him. I think going forward, whatever Max Holloway's next fight, it will be um in play in some fashion so i guess we'll see how that goes but i guess uh for what brian goes just said there i think maybe you want to put the earmuffs on because i don't think you're going to be uh hearing yeah. anything about ufc spain this year and ufc hawaii i definitely don't think is happening uh max has said he's come to terms with like that not being on the table for him and it's probably not going to be something in his career so um, that's the case. And I guess just last thing on um, kind of what Danny said there about Max Holloway's legacy, his legend. I think this was great um, in the sense that I think the three losses to Alexander Volkanovsky kind of, you know, took away some of the steam from him, right? Like he did so many amazing things leading up to those three fights. And then you're just like, okay, well, he's very clearly not the best, you know, featherweight ever. Maybe you could make an argument for the resume and stuff, but like, there's three head-to-head -head losses with a guy who has obviously had a phenomenal run in his own right in Volkanovski and his 
so much of his brand and his legacy was tied to that rivalry with Volk. And now he's moved up to a different division, done something like this, has the BMF belt. And I think it really um, just kind of takes things into a different stage for him, as Danny alluded to. And it, it really allows us to talk to him in a different way. And if he's able to reclaim that belt and then maybe get a fourth fight against Volk, and if he wins that, like, who knows? The world is this man's oyster, but this changed the game for Max Holloway. And I think... Uh, is going to be a huge part of how we ultimately talk about his legacy and, you know, brings him beyond just the Alexander Volkanovsky rivalry. Mm -hmm. Danny, was this the best one yet? You know, they all had finishes, right? All big names. And I know this was the best finish yet. But again, it was 3-1 going in around 5. And if it doesn't finish, it, it ends 4-1, unanimous decision. But overall, do you think it was still the best one yet? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've had three BMF title fights. I think the matchup wise, and I'm still, I'm going to die on this hill. The Nate Diaz versus Jorge Masvidal matchup was the most fitting one for the BMF title. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I'm, I won't go down on a rant on that. But as far as like the fights, the results itself, yeah, the knockout from Gagey was spectacular, putting out Poirier. But this was it, man. Like pointing down to the canvas, risking it all after having the fight in the bag against one of the biggest punchers pound for pound in this sport. And just throwing defense out the window and going all out and getting the knockout in the final second. Again, a weight class above against a very durable guy, a knockout artist. I mean, that is that is badass. That that is some bad motherfucker shit right there. Like, um, yes, this is by far the best BMF title fight we've ever seen, the best BMF moment we've ever seen. And I really think that it's gonna be a, a while if this fight, if, if this title does uh linger for some time, that somebody surpasses that. I mean, this is one of the greatest knockouts ever, really. God yeah. bless the UFC for giving us this footage, right? Dana White's like, if you haven't, you know, ripped it already or taken it, take it now, post it. And yeah, I was just wondering how many times Kenny, our uh, producer in the back there, could play this clip during this segment because legit, you know, I think how, we should. How many just, times do we want to watch this? I think we should just like call the rest of the episode and just play this B-roll for the entirety <laughs> of the of the of the hour that's left. What do you guys think? We yeah. could yeah, because every time it. I see it, I see something different. It is frankly amazing, and a big shout out to Cold Coffee. This is that I know the only show where you can watch this type of B-roll, and he made that happen. And he's always on point here every week. A huge part of the team. So shout out to you, Cold Coffee. Oops. And I think um, a, I guess a... one last point on the BMF belt. Uh, I believe Eric Jackman from MMA Fighting kind of tweeted this out. Like, do you, you just have to retire the BMF belt after this? Like, could literally anything. No surpass what we saw like it's going to be so hard to it'll be tough to surpass now. but that's but, why we create new memories when we try new stuff yeah, and that's why that's i've never been a fan of like marino versus figueredo because how do you know that the next guy might not also deliver something and next thing you know the ufc has what they want they always want new stars so i'm okay with trilogies when it's the right time but i don't like forcing them either you know, I'm not I'm not a big fan of just going uh, Alexa and Valentina yet again, but whatever. You know, um, those th th even even um, Israel versus Alex Fajeda. I, I feel like the UFC has assets in these athletes, and sometimes after a KO, you just let them chill. Like this might actually be the best thing for Volkanovski. As weird as it sounds, because he likes to stay busy, gives him more time to chill. Let this let let this fight breathe. Holloway versus uh, Toporia. Volkanovski can wait for the winner, but he can also wait for him with some appropriate time off after two vicious KOs. And he needs that it. UFC schedule makes it difficult, you know? What are you saying, guys? Yeah. No, he needs that time off. We, yeah. we, we forget about that sometimes, you know? We're so quick to rush people back, but he definitely needs that. And that, that's kind of where the UFC uh, was a, a big winner, I think, in UFC 300 is some of the storylines that have come out of it have kind of played out in their favor. And mm -hmm. I think that's one that's going to actually in the long run will probably play out for Alex Volkanovsky better because he just he needs time off, man. He really does. Yeah. All right, guys, we need going into this weekend that the lightweight division had options and there would be a shakeup in that division. What we didn't know was that the shakeup would come from outside the fighters competing at UFC 300. UFC president Dana White, who never likes to match make after fights, did exactly that. When he announced that Islam Makhachev would defend his lightweight title versus Dustin Poirier at UFC 302, that's June 1st, folks. It's in New York, New Jersey. And later that month, Conor McGregor would face Michael Chandler at UFC 303. Quick note, that's at 170, but come on. These guys have fought at 155. They got huge history at 155, so I'm treating it that way. So let me ask you this. 
Fair or foul, this Makashev and Poye booking, should the UFC have waited for the 300 results? Remember, Makashev and uh, Sarukian and uh, Oliveira was a number one contender fight. And Gagey, he beat Dustin Poye last year to kind of cement his spot. And, of course, because of injuries and other stuff that didn't happen, this fight happened. What's the deal here, uh, Danny? Fair or foul with the UFC kind of doing that, you know, that, that matchmaking there? Foul. Now, I do have to mention that um, I think I believe this is uh, right. And Mike, correct me um, if I'm wrong here. Um, Armin Sarukin's manager said something that he was approached backstage before they they were they announced that fight. This literally just came out recently. So yeah, that's, uh, that's correct. Is, is, he, uh, he did say that. And I asked Dana at the press conference as well. I was like, did you have this fight made coming into tonight or did you wait for the results? And it sounded like they went to Sarukin. And he declined the fight, and they went to Poirier and accepted it, and then they announced it. I'm going to put my tinfoil, uh, my imaginary tinfoil hat here, go conspiracy theory. Uh, I apologize for that, but I, I'm, I'm going to call BS on that. I'm going to call BS. I, I, I think it's probably Armin Sarukin's team kind of, you know, playing company company man and being, okay, yeah, like, we'll, we'll go along with this sort of uh, narrative. But you're telling me that you just make just like that. You make Poirier versus Makashev. Like, dude, these guys have been talking about fighting each other for like the longest time now for like weeks. Um, sorry, but like, if you're going to label a fight, a title eliminator, that's what both fighters expect going into it. That's what the fans expect that's at stake. And it doesn't become a title eliminator, bro. Unless there's injury. Like I have a problem with that, right? Like Hamza Shemaev couldn't compete, right? He was injured. He had a uh, hand injury, but in this case scenario, like yeah, Sarukin almost got finished a couple of times, but that was submission. He looked pretty fresh. He had said prior to the to the fight that he would be interested in doing a quick turnaround and fighting Islam Makashev, no problem. And all of a sudden, the title eliminator, it's not so title eliminator now because Dustin Poirier will be fighting for the UFC lightweight belt. And I love Dustin Poirier, fantastic fighter. Um, That's going to be a great fight as well. But I'm sorry, if you're going to label something title eliminator, it better be a damn title eliminator. Well, that doesn't mean more and more. It doesn't mean that won't be Sarukian's next fight. Uh, he'll still probably fight for the title in Abu Dhabi, probably against Islam, if and when he beats Poirier. Uh, so like, yeah, but it's, it's still him. not the next guy. And look, Max Holloway got a huge win at 155 and the and the BMF belt. You got Conor McGregor fighting later that month at 170 uh, against Michael Chandler. You're telling me that Conor, if Conor McGregor picks up a win, he's not going to surpass the uh, Sarukian and get a title it's, shot? It's definitely with, with a risk, but if you're Sarukian too, he already lost to Islam once on short notice on his UFC debut. If you're him and you're looking at Islam thinking he's going to be the champ for a while, is it your best interest to do a seven-week turnaround from this fight and maybe not put yourself in the most advantageous position in terms of trying to win that. And then you're screwed if you're 0-2 for Islam. So it is a tricky situation. I understand it all. Um, this is like one of those things that we talk about all the time here. The the timing versus the most deserving, right? Like UFC has this card. Islam wanted to fight there. As I talked to him about a few weeks ago, he didn't care who it was. And obviously we know Dustin Poirier is aware of the state of the lightweight division. He's not ignorant about how the sport works. So if they call them up and said, you want to take this fight, Armin just turned it down. He's saying, hell yes. So um, it's just kind of a product of circumstance, but I think all these guys are going to get their chances. We'll see. We'll see. But I, I, I've i seen, you know, recently several title eliminators get labeled that and, and then not be that. So um, look, Hamza Shemaev was supposed to fight for the belt, right? Like, and now he's fighting Robert Whitaker. Why isn't he next? Why isn't he just going up against the champion, Jerkis Duplessis now? Like, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm a little bit old school, but like, it kind of loses meaning when you label these fights and then the next one doesn't end up being the winner. You think the UFC should just clarify that even though this was at stake, that party turned it down so that the transparency is there, Danny? Is that what you're saying? Or I, I just have a hard time believing that um, somebody turns down a fight and then within minutes you already have a title fight booked. And then give keeping in mind that like the calendar made sense prior to UFC uh, 300. They both had been talking about in the media that they wanted to fight each other. Big fight for Makashev, big fight for Poirier. Like, I just feel like this was done before before the event, in my opinion. Uh, stuff mm -hmm. happens. Yeah, Remember when... Oil hat off. Remember right. when... Uh, we had the draw between Jan Blachowicz and Ankalaev and Dana White came to the press conference like 20 minutes later and uh, announced Jamal Hill versus Glover Teixeira for like sure. a few weeks later. And that was that was all done in the span of like 30 minutes. So these guys, 
when the UFC wants to move quick and make something happen, they can make it happen. And uh, I guess we will ask. I'm, of course, going to try to talk to Dustin Poirier at some point soon here, and I'll ask him. I'll say, hey, bro, did you – what, what happened here in terms of the timeline? Did they call you during the card between the time Armin won and by the time Dana showed at the press conference? And we'll get our answer, Danny. So just wait with anticipation over there. Okay, okay, fine. <laughs> um, listen, how about this McGregor Chandler announcement as well? I know it's at 170, but I think it impacts lightweight, like Danny stated. If McGregor wins, it's going to be hard to deny him. Of course, McGregor's throwing out Edwards' name. And no, he's let's keep it 100. If McGregor wins, he's getting the next title shot at 155. Okay, yeah. all right. So, do you, not you, at do you think... uh, maybe, maybe that could be an option too. All right. Uh, well, what do you think goes? Do you think this fight actually impacts 155? Let's get your opinion on this topic. Uh, hell yeah, it does. I mean, look, that that's what the UFC has wanted all along, right? Anytime you can throw Conor McGregor into a situation like that, that's what they want. Why not? He's their biggest star. Um, I don't like that it's at 170. You know, I think that's a clear advantage for him. It's a disadvantage for Michael Chandler. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. It's going to happen that way. And look, don't get it twisted. I, I'm kind of with Danny. I think if he does get a win, especially if he gets it kind of in a destructive fashion, which I don't think this is going to the judges, a KO, they'll probably try and pull that card. But I'll tell you what, pulling that card today is a lot easier to stomach than it would have been maybe a month ago, right? Like, look at some of the names that are out of the picture now. Oliveira's out of the picture. Gagey's out of the picture. Uh, Poirier and Islam are going to fight each other. One, one of those guys is going to be out of the picture. So, like, I kind of get it. And every one, now and again, I'm okay with them doing this type of thing. It's just consistency. You can't do it all the time, right? Like Danny's saying, these title eliminators, every now and again, shit happens. We get it. But when you keep labeling things a certain way and you don't go that way, that's when it starts to feel weird and not not feel like a, a true sport. But that's something that they're going to want to do with with Michael Chandler and with the, or sorry, with Conor McGregor. I wouldn't be shocked to see him be next if he gets a win here. Well, and I know it's kind of very inside baseball too, but. It's known, right? Connor has two fights left on his UFC contract. You yeah. think they're giving him a title shot with one fight left? I think that's going to be what really depends. Maybe they would because I don't know what potential champions language there would be in there, but that's assuming mm -hmm. Connor wins, which if it was Connor McGregor versus Islam Makachev, I think Connor would be a very steep betting underdog in that matchup. And then is the UFC going to let Connor? you know, fight a title fight with one fight left on his contract. I think he would need to do a new deal before they would move forward with that. So that's a huge piece of the puzzle here as well, in terms of him fighting for a belt uh, coming off that. And I know that might not be the thing the fans want to hear because they just want to talk about the matchups and stuff like that. But the business is just as relevant when it comes to all this. And especially with Conor McGregor, Mike, you, you think with what, let's say they do not renegotiate. You think the UFC is more lenient in giving him a title shot or, or no? Sounds like no. You mean like would they give him the shot if he didn't resign on his final fight? Yeah, I don't I don't think so, right? Because then what unless like they felt so confident he was gonna win and then there's some champion clause that extends the contract and locks him in, but then you're obviously right. risking it. And we're talking about some very tough matchups here against Islam Makachev or you know, whoever it may be. But so, I mean yeah. if he's determined to try out free agency, um, you know, the UFC would ideally like to send him on, on a loss right like lower down his his stock if he's going to go to the mm -hmm. competition so it's like a win-win i see it if he beats makashev there's probably some clause in there of championship clause that will tie him down if he loses well eh, mcgregor's past his prime this and that um i think you do not want to put him in a position against someone like um you know like a non-title fight where he picks up a huge win and then walks out on top right like um, I mean, look, sure. look how they try to kind of say goodbye to Nate Diaz, like with the whole setup yeah. with, with, we'll see like, a lot of that, right. It'll be a long wait. It'll yeah. be Connor. Like, you know, they're, they're keeping me on the shelf. A lot of stuff that we've seen. So it could be a year <laughs> up until that point happens. And then who knows who fights in between that. I, I certainly know Islam Makachev is going to sit around and wait for Connor McGregor. Mm -hmm. Right. Hey, Mike, you brought up baseball. If you guys don't mind, I'd like to throw a curveball at you guys, because this is hey. something George and I were talking about. You like that? Uh, some George and I were talking about on the radio show last night with Conor McGregor. How would you almost advise this situation? Because if he does explore free agency, right? It's not like Conor McGregor is going to be fighting for very much longer. But if you look at the guys that are outside the UFC, Nate Diaz, 
you you look at Jorge Masvidal, the Jake Paul's names always get thrown out, right? And Pacquiao. Rocking, stuff like that. Pacquiao. Uh, one of the best things that Floyd Mayweather ever did in his career was become his own promoter, right? That's something that I think the UFC would hate to see him go out and do that. At the same time, Conor McGregor probably loves being a UFC fighter, right? He's said that many times. What do you think the UFC would have to do to keep him other than money, right? Because they say it all the time. He's got money. I think I think it's just more money, right? <laughs> it's like he said before, he's like, I want equity. I want this, that. I don't think any of that stuff's happening. So um, they got to pay the bills. But I think Connor is just as curious. Like if you saw that interview he did with Ariel Hawani a few weeks ago, he was like, there's been no negotiations because I don't think the UFC even knows how to approach me to have a conversation like that at this point, but it's all coming together, man. Like the UFC, when they go into this TV rights negotiation with ESPN um, coming up at the end of next year, they want Conor McGregor under contract. They want to be able to tell them we have this guy. We're going to be able to sell mm -hmm. pay-per-views on ESPN plus. And you know, if it's not ESPN, if it's a Netflix, if it's whomever comes in the game, trying to get UFC's rights, um, they want to be able to say Conor McGregor is a chit they have in their pocket to, uh, you know, lift up the brand and all that stuff. So I, I imagine he's not going to free agency. Like Dana, I think said at the press conference on Saturday that Conor McGregor is going to fight here. He's going to retire here. Connor has said he's a UFC life for all that stuff. Um, it seems like things are in a pretty decent spot between them right now. We'll see what happens in terms of the fight promotion. Um, I don't know how thrilled Connor is with his big return being announced at the post fight press conference at two in the morning from a crumpled up piece of paper that Dana White got handed mid press conference. That whole thing was a little bit strange. I also understand the side of it of not wanting to take it away from the athletes at UFC 300 by announcing it on the broadcast. So whatever. I mean, the fight's going to be huge, no matter how they announced it, but that whole thing was a little bit weird. So yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of moving parts with this for sure. I think he wants what Francis stated, and that's the freedom to do something like that. But I think he'd also like to do it like he did it the one time. I'm going to fight Floyd and make a lot of money. I guess he'll have to cut a piece of the pie to, to the UFC, but also stay with the UFC. I believe him when he says, I love the UFC and I want to be with them. And I know Dana probably gets frustrated with Connor, but he never really puts him down. You know, he says he's easiest to work with or whatever. I'm sure there's stuff that goes on there that he doesn't like hearing because Connor does know his worth. So I think that's what he wants goes. It's just if if there's Saudi Arabia money that wants to pay me hundred million the box on mm -hmm. some jabroni, right? I want to do that, but I'd like to stay with you guys too. Can we make that work? And so I think that's what's going to have to happen is the UFC is going to have to maybe work with them on an occasional fight. I don't think there's many of those left because this guy's already – how old is he, guys? 35, 36, McGregor, and he hasn't fought in almost Five four years. Eight, right? yeah. So, I mean, really, I mean, he's he's obviously past his prime. He can still sell. He still moves the needle. I get that part. But, yeah, that, that I think that's what, he's want, what he wants. He's been there and seen what Francis has done, and I think he's like, whoa, that's legit. Like, you know, I, I want that because I know I can – double that triple that or whatever so i think it has probably something to do with that yeah um guys let's talk about the rest of the 55 division we you know the sarukian thing he declined obviously as mike pointed out could he be next in october in abu dhabi possibly yeah holloway yes he's a serious contender at 55 but i think the play is toporia at 45 because you know poye and islam is is already made so uh, let's talk about someone else that was on this card. I want to give him some love. Han Hanato Moicano. Danny, talk about this guy. You know, he is Money Moicano, and he came up with a big win. You know, Turner thought he had walked off uh, like, like a like a major leaguer, right, hitting a home run, and he admired his work for too long. The fight wasn't over, and Moicano comes back and beats him up. But he's on a quiet little streak of his own. Yeah, a lot of people uh, don't realize it, but but he's undefeated at lightweight in his past five fights. Um, some people might want to bring up the RDA fight, but that was at a catch weight of 160. Also a fight that he took on short notice. Uh, I believe it was like a week or something. So I kind of give him a pass for that one. But if you look at his la latest run, like the guy has been putting together an impressive resume at 155. Uh, he submitted Jai Herbert. He submitted Alexander Hernandez, submitted Brad Riddell, uh, decision Drew Dober, and now TKO Jalen Turner. Man, that, that's quite the run right there. I think Moicano at 34 years of age is primed for a big opportunity. 
Uh, he's not getting any younger. His his days as a, as a top lightweight or, or being uh, as a top athlete are probably numbered. So I'd like to see him get a good opportunity because I do feel like he's a dark horse in the division. I do feel like he can do some big stuff. And I do feel like he could be a big of a star, like a bit of a star, like maybe not reach the Conor McGregor levels, but shit, I, I, could, I can see him, you know, headlining some fight nights and whatnot, given the right matchup. So I don't know. I'd like to see him get a big name. I think Dan Hooker would be a great fighter. Or, I don't know, but Neil Darius, but somebody with with uh, with a name and a good car placement as well. Moicano at this point deserves it. He's he's playing ball with the UFC, being a great promoter. Um, I think it's time that he gets a big shot. Chris gets goes Patty, wild. or is that uh, does that one go to Bobby Green? I think that's more of a Bobby Green thing, but I wouldn't hate it if if Moicano gets booked against Patty. I just think that that's a far less competitive fight in my opinion. Hmm. Chris goes wild in the chat says Moicano has the best promo. Uh, anytime he Great wants problem. the mic, give it to him. Another He's 55 world of finances. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Miller versus Bobby Green. Talk about that fight, goes. I think it broke your heart a little bit. I, I you know, we never really side with each guy other than on staff picks. Um, and, and both we've covered for a long time, but it, it, it is. Kind of sucks to see someone just kind of get a, a whooping like like Miller got on Saturday night. Yeah, kind of was that. I mean, look, Bobby Green fought a great fight. He had an excellent game plan. He stuck to it. He never deviated from it. Um, there'd probably be a lot more W's on his record if, if he were able to fight every fight like that, right? Stick to that game plan and just do that over and over. Every time Miller even got close, there was a jab just waiting for him, and that face was so busted up. Jim Miller's a stud. Look, he's been doing this for a long time. I hope he takes a second look at what happened on Saturday night. I'm not saying retire. I'm just saying maybe take a seat. And at this point, I think he's maybe earned the opportunity to say, this is the name. This is the location. This will be my last stand. Something like that, right? Because uh, that, that was a tough one to watch for him. He, he took a beating from Bobby Green. Yeah, his, and his streak that he had is over. So I, I think what a lot of fighters commonly say is when I know I can't compete at a high level, that's the time where I really need to start thinking about, you know, putting it down. And no disrespect to Green, but he's not a top five lightweight. He might not even be a top ten lightweight. And he really put it on yeah. Jim Miller. And Jim Miller's accomplished so much. I just don't see how he doesn't go into the UFC Hall of Fame one day because of the records he has. But I think it was Mike that pointed out this guy's still what, what's he want to get to 50 fights Mike I think he said or something like that or? yeah maybe something like that I think he's this is at 44 so that maybe Ooh, is a little bit yeah. of a stretch now yeah, especially the great. damage that he much. took here and I see Scott Christian in the chat saying I can't figure out why Miller uh didn't attempt more takedowns I think there was about 300,000 reasons why he didn't uh attempt more takedowns in this fight but yeah that was, that was rough to watch and credit to Bobby Green though man like he I was worried about him too coming into this fight after that loss to Jalen Turner he got the crap yeah. beat out of him and the ref almost let him die in there so for him to come back and stand in there he took some big shots to fight that same style with his hands low he didn't let that change him at all so credit to him for that hey this Josh, just came to mind patty pimblet jim miller it's great i'm okay it. with it be fun i'm okay with it hey josh like golden jim saying miller over and over I, that I, miller I isn't jersey. ufc hall of fame oh, would you guys think he's ufc hall of fame jim miller I'm not ready to have this conversation again. Let's save this for the next fight. <laughs> I can't do this. Uh, bring, bring on says, Daniel Cormier. Ask what he thinks. JK yeah. says he definitely is, but Josh Goldman in the chat says he's not. Chat. Chat room. I want an answer from all of you. Is Jim Miller Hall of Fame worthy? Because I really feel he is. He's got, he's got this longevity, and he's got a lot of records. He's got a lot of skins on his wall. Uh, mm -hmm. Never won a major title, but not everyone that's in the Hall of Fame has won a major title. So think about that. I'd like to hear from you guys. Please, also, we're about halfway through the show. Great time to retweet, especially if you like what you're hearing, right? Retweet, reshare, let people know. This is a show that's every Monday and it's live. Usually it's a noon Eastern, 9 a.m. start time. We're going 90 minutes, though, because of the significance of UFC 300. And, of course, if you miss any part of the show, you can catch the replay. It's up immediately here on this outstanding channel. So that's every more reason to hit like. And subscribe so you can get more of this content. Uh, it's daily and it's fat and it's packed with content. So please, please hit that like button, hit the subscribe. Uh, let's move on here, guys. By the time we even got to the title fights, the UFC fans seem spent. I know Goes and I were. Sounds like Mike Bond and Danny Segura were as well after that BMF title fight. 
Um, Alex Fajeda, he made quick work of Jamal Hill, finishing him in round one with a vicious left hook. Looked like a scoop punch, which is a combination of an uppercut and a hook. But, I mean, it was on point. Of course, some follow-ups did the job. How much of a gangster is Alex Fajeda, goes? Dude, I mean, look at what he set up here. If you look at his hit list, what he's gone through, how quickly he's just come into the UFC and taken it by storm, a huge gangster. And this is a guy that doesn't really speak the language, right? Like, you have Jamal Hill. He's an American. At that press conference, he was getting booed. People love Pereira. Um, I, he fights the way everybody would want to see a fighter fight. I mean, God, it's just so interesting. Everything that comes out of his mouth, he's got a great personality. Like, the, the sky is the limit for this guy. He just keeps growing and growing. And, you know, every time, no matter who you put in front of him, there are ways, like when you break it down, yes, he's vulnerable in some regards, but he finds a way to win fights. And that's just so important, the way he fights these fights. I can't wait to see this guy's name pop up on a pay-per-view. I automatically buy it if I see it. Should they consider a UFC 301 turnaround for Alex Fajeda? Now, this would be at heavyweight, Danny Segura. Um, so, and it wouldn't be a title fight. So I think Dana might've got confused. Nobody was really put, I don't think he was pushing for an Aspinall matchup, but just to kind of like, we'll say save the card, no disrespect to Pantoja versus Urseg, but it, it's just not what we've been used to here since UFC 298, 299, 300. We're looking for a little bit more pop and he's, he's, you know, he said he might be interested in a heavyweight. What, what are your thoughts on that? I, I absolutely love it, and I think this is something the UFC should actually consider. And, and yeah, as you mentioned, George, I think this got lost in translation in the post-fight interview, like in the octagon. Um, I, I, I'm I'm on very little sleep and a lot of coffee, so I don't remember exactly what he said at the presser. But I, I think there was a, bis, a big miscommunication here because Pereira had actually said, um, I want to fight at UFC 301. Remember, that's we they, it had been rumored that he was originally supposed to headline that against uh, Hill. But because of lack of UFC 300 main event, they they bumped him down to uh, to uh, Saturday. Uh, but he said, I want to participate. I want to be at UFC 301. I know a title fight takes a long time to promote. That's all good. Give me a heavyweight fight. He didn't mean a title fight because a lot of people were saying, oh, Aspinall and, and Pereira at 301, that'd be crazy. He just wants a fight. I see this very much like when Anderson Silva was king at 185 and was going up every now and then to fight James Irving at 205, fight Stefan Bonner at 205. Very manageable fight, still very interesting because he's going up a weight class. I think there's even more interest here because he's going to heavyweight, right? 205 and 185 are somewhat somewhat similar. Bro, give him a Jairzinho Rosenstruck. Give him a, a, a Delima. Give him somebody right at the top 15 or right outside of it at heavyweight. Why not? If you want to build the, the badass legend of Alex Pereira, have him fight in Brazil. UFC 301, mad respect to uh, Pantoja, who, who's a stud. But like Pantoja, Ersig as the main event, um, Anthony Smith, uh, B Vitor Petrino. I mean, Jonathan Martinez, Jose Aldo is a damn good fight. Uh, Paul Craig, Kyle Boralio, that's your main card. Like, all respect to those guys, so solid fighters, but like, you need more star power. So, if you put in a heavyweight fight, say Jairzinho Rosenstruck versus Alex Pereira, dude, that'd be amazing. He took no damage, there's no weight cut involved. Somehow, he's still ha having a, a big cut to 205. Don't know how he made 185, but, anyways, different story for a different day. UFC, please, please consider it. And I again, like I mentioned earlier, if he loses, I don't think that's that big of a deal. He's kind of become like a cult following like Nate Diaz uh, and others where people just want to see him fight. People just want to see him do a damn arrow and say Shama. That's it. I got a name for you. What about Taito Ivasa? Because you're looking for a brawler, right? You said Delima I'm about leg it. kicks. I'm about uh, it. Jarzino throws uh, hands. Sign me up. Yeah, Taito Ivasa is another great name. Mike Bond, are you into it? Or are you kind of shaking your head? Or are you, are you nodding in approval? You, or you're you not can go... It? Go to goes first on this yeah. one before look, I uh, look. drop a bomb on this one. Uh, guys, <laughs> I, I oh, look, Kenny, I mean, cut his mic. I, I understand. I, I get it. It's a great story. It would be tremendous. We would all be into it. But, bro, is it worth the risk? I mean, KOs can risk. change the trajectory of your career. Ask Alex Wolkanovsky. Ask Jamal Hill how he feels tonight. Uh, turning it around. I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk away. away. You, you guys tell me when, when you guys. Are <laughs> Dude, th this can be something really bad if it doesn't go his way, and I don't know that it, it just brings that much to the table that would make you wanna, wanna do it. But I, I'm kind of curious. I want to see this bomb get dropped. Well, I was saying protect your assets, UFC. Is that what you mean? Like, hey, protect this could be assets. nice, but it's too much and not enough reward and a lot of risk. 
Mm -hmm. All right, Mike, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think you guys just said that pretty much. I don't think this is happening from everything I'm hearing. Um, it would take a reversal, of course, in the UFC's thinking. But from what I heard yesterday, talking to some people, asking around, um, I think the UFC is content with what UFC 301 is going to be. It's not a great card, um, but <laughs> the tickets are sold. The event has already been put on, all that kind of stuff. I don't think they're going to add Alex Pereira, who we didn't even mention. You know, He said he broke his toe a couple weeks before this fight, uh, came in with an injured toe, didn't want to pull out of that uh, of this card and everything and had to push through. But to ask him to do another fight a few weeks later, I don't know if it's the ideal circumstance. Um, and if it did happen, it would be a complete reversal, of course, from everything I'm hearing from uh, various people in the industry. So um, it's fun to talk about, but I don't think it's happening. It is mm -hmm. fun. And the names that you guys threw out, well, I don't know about two, but it would be fun, man. It, it would be fun, but uh, I'm I'm not for it. All right. So we all agree, uh, Pereira heavyweeks, three weeks. <laughs> no, happen, they're not right? feeling it. They're, they're masses. They're, they're actually they're just announced it. It's official, Danny, while you were gone. Oh, there we go. See? Yeah. Thank you, MMA gods. Thank you so much. Glad I, I think put you're that more likely to see Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage, too, than Alex Pereira versus <laughs> heavyweight at UFC 301. Um, all right. Uh, let's see here. I want to ask you guys, though, what, what is really next for Pajeda at 205? Is Ankalai of the, the slam dunk here, Mike? Yeah, I mean, uh, if not, <laughs> not if you want Alex Pereira to stay Come UFC on. champion. Get I mean, that a title the shot. thing is, again, I've, I'm in this weird stage where I, I can't get a read on every Alex Pereira fight. I feel like I get it wrong whether I predict him to win or predict him to lose, whatever. It seems to go the opposite way. Um, but this one, man, like that's his st toughest stylistic matchup, Mega Man and Kaliyev, right? I think that would be uh, pretty much universally agreed. So I don't know if the UFC wants to go that direction, but if Pereira were to beat him, man, that would be so impressive. And I think answer a lot of questions. I mean, he got, he does have a Jiu Jitsu black belt now, apparently, even though he didn't go to the ground for a single second in this fight. But <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think for Pereira, that's the one you probably got to do. I mean, you could do the Yuri Prohoshka rematch. Um, I don't know if they want to do that quite yet. Yuri was definitely not at his best in their first fight. He barely trained. He had a ton of injuries and he fought maybe not the smartest fight in the world. So maybe he's learned some lessons, but the way he fought Alexander Rakic, I don't know if that, that proves true. He might try to fight him the exact same way and just knock him out with someone wild. But yeah, it's got to be the two-man race, right? Like it's either Ankalaev or Prohoshka. And man, Ankalaev is on what, a 12-fight unbeaten streak? <laughs> it's got to be him. Yeah, I don't see yeah. how it's not. And I wonder if that'll take place in Abu Dhabi or if Pajeda commands a little bit of... Uh, you know, if he carries a little bit of weight, maybe he insists on New York or or something. But that is a very tough matchup for him. And the UFC has a star on their hands with Alex Fajeda. So who knows if they'll try and maybe steer him away from that matchup, at least for one more set of fights. I, I do remember Jan Blahovich. I thought he was going to get taken down over and over. And, and uh, you know, he hung tough. So who knows? It's These guys get better in between fights. Uh, Fajeda keeps surprising us over and over. Right. And, and you can't baby like Pereira's title reign. Like he's gonna have to fight somebody that doesn't that doesn't favor his style at some point, right? And I think at this point, like he, twelve fights in, he should have enough experience. Like Mike Mike said, got a black belt. Why not run it? Bug it. I think it's time. And, and look, look at the division. Who else is available? Like you're gonna do the Prochaska again, really? And then outside yeah, of that, like fought. there's yeah, nobody. Fought. Rakic, Lahovic, like those Rakic are the top fought. guys. I think he's got to. Yeah. Smith gets a big win at UFC 301. <laughs> no, nope, needs a little bit more. Needs a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. All right, guys. How about Zhang Wei Li? That's her third title defense in the Komen event. She defeated Jonan Yan via unanimous decision, also by rear naked choke, and also by unanswered <laughs> strike to the dome. But she only got one win, not three. Uh, the only, the first result's the only one that matters. That's the official one. What did you guys think of Wei Li's performance? Goes. You know what, man? I went back and forth on this because, look, it's another notch on her belt. Good for her. You're right. She could have probably beaten her three times the way that fight went down. Um, it's a great win. She was dominant. But at times, when she was getting knocked down so many times, it, it kind of built a level of doubt. For as dominant as her performance was, 
all I could think of is I'm I'm thinking Tatiana Suarez is sitting in her living room just salivating because I think that makes that fight so much more intriguing now. Um, great moment for Zhang Weili. I think on the broadcast, you know, we have to watch it with the volume down a little bit, but I think, you know, I heard a couple of times she's getting tired and you could tell maybe she was, but at the end of the day, it's a championship fight. How do you not get tired? I thought she dug deep when she needed to. Uh, when things weren't going her way, she was able to make the adjustments. The guy who doesn't get a lot of credit to her success, I think John Wood gives excellent advice in the corner. I thought he did a great job. Uh, but all in all, I think it was a good night for her. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, what would you do next for Zhang Weili? Tatiana? Uh, I would, yeah, it's got to be Tatiana Suarez, right? Like that's the fight. Um, that's been probably the logical matchup for a while, but Tatiana can't get her consistency, can't, you know, get the timing to work out. But now, like, I know she just pulled out of that fight in February and dealing with some health stuff again. You just got to do this at this point. Like, if Tatiana wins and can't stay healthy after that, you deal with the repercussions. But at this point, I think that's the biggest fight, though. It seems like the riskiest matchup for the champion. And from all indications, if that... Uh, Chinese reporter at the post-fight press conference who claimed the v fight had already had 30 billion views, which I don't even know if that's mathematically possible <laughs> given all the time uh, that we had in between those two things. But obviously a huge deal over there. Uh, Yan Xiaonan is, or Zhang Wali is a money printing machine for the UFC right now as champion. So I don't know, maybe you want to preserve her title reign a little bit, but I think this is the fight to do. Well, there's like, eight million people on the planet so i think each person would have had to watch it four times within an hour that was that was a bit much yeah but i imagine that maybe it was three three billion who knows i could see dana white going nuts though he's thinking of the prospects of obviously how big the ufc can grow in asia especially in china they've invested in a pi out there uh danny zhang Weili keeps adding to her resume but she's got a couple glaring losses to rose number Yunus. Who also owns wins over Yoani uh, and Jacek. Yoani and Jacek's at the top with most title defenses. How do you shake out this whole strawweight goat talk? We kind of teased it a little bit uh, in, the, in the last few weeks, but did, did she just kind of gain or maybe take that spot? Where, where do you see her? I, I already said it. I said it on uh, last week on the on the preview for 300. It's Yoani and Jacek. It's still Yoani and Jacek, and it's going to be Yoani and Jacek for some time. She was the only one that consistently kept the belt for years. Six title defenses. Now, obviously, this right. helps uh, Zhang Weili's case, uh, but she's got to do a little bit more. I think, you know, those losses to Rose Namajun, especially one because she got knocked out, really did her, her uh, run to become the GOAT at strawweight. Um, let's log in a couple more title defenses, and then we'll have this conversation again. But it's you on a champion for now. Well, I think that's, she's got that's five, not six, and Zhang Weili has three. But Zhang Weili owns two wins over her. And Joanna, the other one we're talking about in the mix is Rose, and she's got two losses GG. to Rose. Dennis Seaver you know? owns a win over BJ Penn, and he ain't the GOAT. <laughs> Well, they didn't fight at their prime. You know what I'm talking about. In title fights, maybe it didn't really say, go well for Joanna. Maybe you say Jun didn't fight her at her prime. What's that? Maybe I don't think Jun Jacek fight her at her prime. Prime Zhang Weili and, and a bit of a different era. She comes from 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 a little bit of more more old school. I don't know, man. It, it's it's a great conversation. I don't know that there's the right one. See, the way you're dismissing it, like it shouldn't even be talked about. That's the part <laughs> yes. that turns me off a little bit. Uh -huh. It's five to three in title defenses. And those two losses at the head are, are, are kind of hard to look champion, the other way. Baby. That's it. One name. So right now, who would you say is greater between Usman and Edwards? Usman. Even though he's 0-2 against Edwards. Why do they fight yeah. then? One Dude, we're two. talking about greatest. We're not talking about best. <laughs> Usman's done more as a champion. He has. I understand that. But, I, man, those head-to-heads, they have to mean something. Um. All right. Well, mm -hmm. Jean Wei Lee versus Tatiana Suarez, if her health remains. Is there another name that's floating out there that we should keep an eye on? Is, is Andrade on this two fight win streak being a former champ? Is she starting to finagle that's her way back life. in? Because she took a couple L's, but now she she's took she's beaten. She's only she only fights killers, by the way. And and now she's got Marina Rodriguez uh, uh on her list. Yeah, it's yeah, just a tough style. Yeah. She got ahead, she Mike. got starched in what like 30 seconds by uh Wally when they first fought yeah. over there in yeah. China. So yeah, I mean, it's been a, a while, but I feel like yeah, there hasn't 
I haven't seen anything that makes me feel like that fight would go significantly different. It might just be longer. Let's I like that fight. Women's Anytime women's I get to watch Jessica and Draj fight, I'm in. She she's super exciting. He, you know, heavy, heavy hands. I mean, anything can happen when she fights. But yes, Tatiana Suarez is the answer. She should be next. Um, and if that's the case, I'd like to see a title eliminator between Andrade and, and Jandy Rova. I think, I think that makes sense. Be fun. Mm -hmm. it's interesting. I like it. Let's stick with women's MMA. Kayla Harrison had her debut in the UFC. A uh, big high-profile free agent signing for the UFC a few months ago. Right away, they put her in a matchup against Holly Holm, right? Great week. She got some embedded time. She made weight. Looked like she was healthy making weight, although she did confess in the post-fight that the last pound was tough. She got a good reception from UFC fans throughout the week, and then she mauled a former UFC champion. Not bad. Grade her UFC, Uf, little, grade her UFC debut, Mike Bond. Uh, a plus, 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 mm -hmm. plus. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. That, that was unbelievable. Um, any, anyone who is worried about the weight cut affecting her in terms of like stamina or aggression or all that stuff, man, like she shut all that down real quick. This was so impressive. And I know you can say a lot of stuff about Holly Holmes decision making in that fight. Like you kind of reversed her once on the first takedown. Are you thinking you can like suddenly grapple with Kayla Harrison or something? She said in her statement after that, you know, she didn't follow the game plan even to the slightest bit, but I don't know if it would have mattered, man. Like Kayla Harrison was determined and absolutely locked in in this fight. And I don't think anything was stopping her at this point. So what a debut she delivered in every way possible uh, on the scale, in the cage, in the post-fight interview, in her press conference, everything and more. She did a fantastic job. One of the great UFC debuts in recent memory. And she has now changed the game in the women's bantamweight division. Um, if I'm Raquel Pennington, I'm trying to get a fight against Juliana Pena booked literally as soon as possible before the UFC calls me offering Michaela Harrison because uh, that's a much more winnable fight for Raquel Pennington, I think, against Pena. So, yeah, she's she's here, and uh, if she can continue to make 135. And that is the thing. You said the the one pound she said at the end was tough. She's going to have to cut one more if she mm -hmm. wants to you know fight in a title fight and be a defending champion. And, you know, as we've seen many times, that last pound is the hardest. So... Who knows there, but she is professional. She has the right people around her. I know she went to bed the night before weigh ins, only one pound over. Um, mm. So that's like looking pretty good for her. So as long as she can keep discipline and do the thing, um, look out everyone at Women's Bantamweight. Goes, what grade would you give Kayla Harrison? I uh, don't know how many pluses were added to that A, but I agree <laughs> with it. That, that was spot on. I mean, everything you said. She, how many fights mm -hmm. did she have, right? Making weight. She won over the crowd. She dominated the fight. It's a win over a former champion. So it kind of tells us where you are in this new crop of fighters. But what stood out the most to me was just the improvement in her focus and in her game. She just seems like she's that much quicker. She was that much stronger. Her decision making, her the process of everything was so impressive. Um, we were just talking about Alex Bahia, right? And and the leaps and bounds that you know, the improvements that he's made. If she continues to do this, um, we got something really big already. I can't imagine what we're going to have in a year from now. I mean, look at all the branches that she's kind of created, all the topics that have come out of her performance, the people outside of the UFC, they're still saying her name. Uh, she can do a lot here, man. She had an A plus, 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 whatever Mike said, that's what it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and you know, she rehydrated the 160. This was asked of her at the post fight. I thought I found this interesting. And then the, the next question was, Well, what about when you fought at lightweight? What did you rehydrate to? She said 160. So that's a lot of water, you know, off a very lean body that came off, but she retained it and she still looked great. I don't know if she'd look great at five pounds at five rounds, you know, uh, at 135, but so far she basically ticked every box. Yeah, uh, it should she be next for Raquel Pennington. I mean, like, there's merit. And there's what sells, Danny Segura? I mean, I feel like Juliana Pena has deserved a, a shot for some time, but, like, how do you not make the Raquel Pennington and Kayla Harrison title fight? I mean, that is the biggest fight you can possibly make uh, at 135 pounds right now in the women's weight class, obviously, uh, right now. Um, and, look, that division is in a very poor state. Ever since the Ronda Rousey days, ever since um, the Amanda Nunes days, the division just kind of had a, 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 a dip 
uh, a, a vast dip. And I think if you want to bring the stock back up of the division, you got to plug in Kayla Harrison into a title fight. She's easily um, the biggest name and the most interesting name right now at the moment in, in the weight class. And, and she's got to fight for a belt next. I just feel like this is a, a no-brainer. And on top of that, you know, uh, something that we might have to uh, point out here, she caught the attention of Amanda Nunes, who posted a selfie video with the screen going like this, waiting for her to say her name. Look, Amanda Nunes, I think right now she's probably the greatest, like the, still the best right now if she were to come back today. Um, but I don't think she has a ton of time left. So if you're going to put in a Juliana Pena title fight, then wait to see what happens. Give the winner to Kayla Harrison. Become champion if Car Kayla Harrison wins the belt. And then have Amanda Nunes try to come back. I think you're just making the queue longer. Give Kayla Harrison the title shot. See what happens. If she wins, I, th I think there's a good chance that she lures back uh, Amanda Nunes. And that'll be arguably one of the biggest fights in women's MMA history. So I think this is a much needed uh, addition to the division. And as goes in Mike said, A++++++. Top five, made of the weight, looked great, got the attention of the biggest name, former champ, probably gets a title shot. I mean, just fantastic stuff for Kayla Harrison. Mike, for the first time on this show, do you agree with Danny? <laughs> uh, I do. Yeah, uh, we dude, We just got to get on with this. Like, again, no disrespect to Raquel Pennington, but she's a tough sell <laughs> as a champion. And as soon as you can, I mean, dude, if she goes out there, she is a good fighter. She's seen it all in this weight class. She has the most fights in women's bantamweight history. Um, I'm not saying she can't beat Kayla Harrison, but she needs to make this compelling for her. I know she has her own history with Juliana Pena and she wants to like get that beef over going back to the ultimate fighter all those years ago. But like, this is, this is the way with Kayla Harrison, she is going to sell this fight and she takes it over. Like a Kayla Harrison versus Juliana Pena fight is way more intriguing to me with Kayla as champion and all that stuff. She wins that. Maybe that's when Amanda comes back. Like there's just, everything seems to stem off Kayla Harrison at this point. Um, Again, like Juliana Pena, does, does she really deserve it? Like, are we just going to let her live off that upset of Amanda for like however long? Like her last win outside of that is January 2021 against Sarah McMahon, no longer in the UFC. Her last win before that is July 2019, Nico Montano, no longer in the UFC. Her last win before that is July 2016. Kat Zingano, no longer in the UFC. And then her wins before that, Jessica I. Wow. Uh, list goes on. So like they're, I don't know. Her mouth is the only thing that's kind of getting her a resume in terms yeah. of or a title it, shot. It's not so. a crime if she gets skipped over, right? It's not like no, and we don't even know if she's healthy. I mean, I haven't, I didn't right. see her out there on Saturday night tweeting a storm saying, "Hey, like, you know, this is this is my title shot, Kayla. You get, you know, get your ass in line, deserve it with another fight, yeah. another win or two. Like this shot is mine." So I don't even know if she's healthier in position to do that. Um, if she was wise, she would be you know, calling up all the media and trying to do interview rounds today and hammering the thing to say, book me and Ra Raquel Pennington right now. Uh, Kayla Harrison can sit on her hands. The people who have been doing work in the UFC for years deserve this title fight. And, you know, you win one more and then you'll get yours or something. Think about the injection of life, though, that this has given this division, right? The way we're talking about it right now. If the right scenarios play out, it can really bring it back to life. It's something that it, it really oh, yeah. needed. Especially if it brings back the GOAT, Amanda Nunes, because that would be two big names mm -hmm. that they have added. Um, let me clean up a little bit here on the chat. We've been talking women's MMA these last couple of topics. Crisco Wild says, I'd say Whaley is greater than Joanna. Uh, Karate Ted Toon says, Rose wants the 125 title. Well, I was just bringing her up in GOAT talk. Uh, I know that she's committed to, to um, flyweight. Chris Goes Wild says, didn't Jandaroba just lose? Well, today's not I Halloween of 2021. She's actually on a three-fight win streak. The last time she lost was October 30 of 2021. So catch up there a little bit, buddy. Tatiana Suarez at the Spear would be money, JK says. Scott Christian said, Kayla looked awesome. We're feeling you, man. He gave her an A+. Plus. Yeah, yep. She took she ticked all the boxes. Joseph Boza says, goes is right. Media hasn't cared. Fans haven't cared since Rocky became champ. Now look at how excited the fans are. The same fans that thought Kayla wouldn't make 136. All right, uh, guys, listen. This was an outstanding card. I want to also... Uh, let me ask you one more question, though, about Kayla. Will she be a champion in the UFC? Real yes. quick, let's go around the horn. Mike, yeah, you think so? Yep. Danny? Yes. Goes? Does Amanda come back? Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, but I don't think Amanda. I'm gonna say yes. I don't think Amanda wins the title before Kayla fights for Mm -hmm. it. So. Yeah. yeah, and if you're Kayla's team, you want the title before Amanda comes back because you want to have pay per view points and be the champion when that fight happens. I think mm-hmm. it can happen. Yeah. And was there something about ah, man? Maybe I heard, it was a late night, guys. But did Cyborg tweet that she wants to do a test cut to 135? Something was that like true? That. Um, her manager did from her account. <laughs> she she didn't tweet anything. I, I would love to see Kayla and, and Harrison. Uh, sorry, uh, Harrison and Cyborg at 145, but 135 never. And I don't think yeah. she'll be. In the UFC anytime soon. Ever. Yeah, it, it sounds like Dana's just not warm to that nope. at all. Um, listen, a lot went down this whole week, not just on fight night. So let's talk about some of the leftovers here. What needs to get some shine as we close the book on UFC 300, the event and fight week? Danny? Man, there's so much to talk about here. Um, you know, talk about some some solid leftovers. This is like Thanksgiving leftovers right here. Like, this is some good shit. Um, okay. Man, I got to shout out Diego Lopez. I got to shout out Diego Lopez. Uh, I know there are other results that, are, that probably are, have more weight and are more important to the respective divisions. But um, I think Diego Lopez has had a, a rise very much like Poatans. Obviously not equal. Poatans is very special. But look, this guy has been in the UFC for less than a year. He debuted in June of last year. He's been in the UFC for less than a year, and he gave Mosvar Evloev, who right now probably deserves the title shot more than anybody, his toughest UFC fight, almost submitted him a couple fights, and maybe there's even an argument that, that you can say that Lopez won, and he took that fight on just a few days' notice. On top of that, he goes out, picks up a, a first-round uh, submission, wins performance of the night, goes out, uh, fights at MSG, important card, picks up a first-round knockout, another performance of the night, now uh, fights at UFC 300 and picks up another first-round knockout. Uh, didn't get performance of the night, but uh, sounds like Dana White's going to take care of him and, and give him some sort of bonus. I mean, this guy's just on fire. Um, I do believe that he – I, I kind of just saw him as a very good fighter, you know, very exciting fighter as well. Um, but now it's like I'm seeing him with different eyes. He went out there and finished a dig Yusuf, something that Edson Barbosa or Arnold Allen couldn't do who are studs, top fives of the division, or at some point. Um, dude, I think the, the future is bright for Diego Lopez. He's young, and I think uh, he's going to fight for a title at some point in time, and I think that's going to be rather quick, given that the UFC very much likes what they have in hand. So um, I got to shout out Diego Lopez. The dude's career so far has been phenomenal. All right, you said leftovers, plural, so hang on to the, a couple there. We'll, we'll go around the horn. We'll come back to you. How about you guys? What, what, what else needs to get some shine from this massive week? You know, I think a lot of times the UFC takes a lot of criticism, you know, rightfully so, depending on what the topic is. But for UFC 300, I loved hearing that Gladiator theme come back. That was just mm. such a shot of yeah. adrenaline. Brought I back a lot say of face memory. The pain. Uh, yeah, Face the Pain. That song is, is amazing. You know, it brings back so many memories. And uh, look, Davidson Figueredo, I think maybe because it was the first fight of the night or what, but Going up in weight and facing two studs like Garbrandt and Font and what he's done to them, there's a lot of promise here. Uh, I think it's really, really cool what he's been able to do and change his career a little bit. It was nice to see him and Brandon Marino, too, in the back talking that. But I want to give the UFC their props. Like They did a good job, man. They made this card fun. Okay. Mike Bond? Um, I guess this is more like a, a slightly more negative slant on it. And it's just, I think the... The spotlight that got put on the lightweight division here right like we already talked about a little bit but man like how quickly this moves right justin gaethje and charles Oliveira probably should have fought both had lightweight title shots in the past few months and now they're quite removed from it right like charles the chain of events from charles Oliveira suffering that cut in his last day of training and pulling out of that fight of october is pretty crazy right like none of the, this bmf fight wouldn't have happened because he would have fought that who knows what would have happened justin gaethje would have got his title shot in february or march and then you know everything kind of happens from there and now justin gaethje is probably further removed from a title shot than he's ever been charles Oliveira, who knows you know that was obviously a very close fight but uh, they took the risk and yeah, like they couldn't get the wins there. And this felt like a, a huge blow for those two in terms of their lightweight title hopes, two guys that should have probably had their shots recently. And now probably are one, two, maybe even more wins away from getting back to that spot. So that was kind of my biggest takeaway from this event outside of like, you know, the greatness of Max Holloway and Poton and stuff, just to see these two guys who have been top five lightweights for the past however many years 
um, really taking that step back with these losses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, before we go to Danny, I want to play. Man, I got to give the USC props. They listen to the fans. They listen to the media. Mark Coleman flying him out and making him a part of that show, regardless of what had happened. Obviously, if, for those that don't know, his family had a fire or the house burned down. Uh, mom and dad were saved by Mark Coleman. Dog didn't make it. Dog named Hammer. Rest in peace, Hammer. Uh, so he was very heroic, but this guy's been through so much. And I love stories about when the UFC takes care of their legends. Mark Coleman had an interview with Mike Bond, and he said, hey, they've taken great care of me. This would just be the cherry on the Sunday if I could, you know, actually place that belt, which is something that – here's another thing I like. I like when someone who's made it to the top reaches down and pulls someone up, like Chael Sonnen says, right? And that's mm -hmm. what Max Holloway did. He threw a bone. He said, I'd love Mark Coleman to put the thing around my waist. Justin Gagey said, fist bump. I would like it for – for it to happen. Coleman thought it might not happen. Bond puts it out there. Dana says, let's do it. And then it happens and see Coleman with his daughters walking out. He's in his suit. You know, I love seeing historical figures in mixed in somehow in historical matchups. So I'm glad that the UFC, you know, did it. I think it went over well. And I hope I see more legends also get some sort of love like that in the future. So I'll give the UFC a fist bump. Danny, back to you. Any more leftovers? Yeah, I think we got to address uh, Algernon Sterling's uh, debut at 145 oh, yeah. pounds. It wasn't very exciting, right? But uh, it's still a former champion going up in weight class and picking up a win over a top 10 guy, right? Um, I do like very much the suggestion that he threw out there with Brian Ortega and kind of threw it out there as a title eliminator. But um, honestly, I, I thought I saw a lot of hate thrown Sterling's way, but for his first fight at 145, I have very little to complain about, and I, th I do think we have a player. I don't know if he's going to be a future champion of the division, but is he going to be part of the title picture? I think so. W what do you guys think? I thought it well, was kind of weird that people were surprised with the way Aljamain fought in that fight. I mean, that's kind of what you have to do in that situation. Uh, it's a huge, massive card. I get that, but it's tough to go up a weight class, man. And uh, Overall, I thought he had a, a decent performance. I mean, look, he took a guy like Calvin Cater. That's tough, man. And he really did not give him any opportunity to move at all or do anything. I, I yeah. think part of the reason there was a bit of that reaction is because when I asked Dana that question about the bonuses at the press conference, Aljo was like behind him, like, yeah, like making mm. it seem like he was going to go hard for that. And then, you know, that was probably the least bonus worthy performance of the whole card. No disrespect, good win and everything. But I think that had a little bit something to do with it. Yeah. Well, he just got slept, and so obviously he doesn't want to throw hands with Cater. But at the same time, yeah, I, I'm sure he was thinking, I'm going to get some takedowns, get the body triangle, go for that neck, maybe work my way to a performance bonus through a submission. But like I said, eight fights were finishes, and a few subs were in there. Um, I would like to see him versus Evloev because they just have – these guys are – you know, they're effective, right? And mm -hmm. and Evloev undefeated, the other guy, former champion. But at the same time, I know how the UFC rolls. Pit them against each other. And let's just see who makes it past that. Although I'm not opposed to uh, him versus uh, Brian Ortega either. I think that'd be fun on the ground. Um, anybody want to give any love to Bo Nickel? Rough night for him. I think he was expecting more, you know, that night. He did win. It just didn't steamroll. And then, of course, he started the booze. By pointing that, you know, he was obviously disappointed in his own performance. Dana White told him to keep his head up. Uh, what do you guys think happened here, guys? Did the UFC just kind of misread this and almost put too much pressure on him? Anybody? Yeah, 100%. And hindsight 2020, but like a lot of people criticized them for being on the main card. And I think that got him uh, kind of on the, that rub a lot, a lot of fans the wrong way. And that kind of got him on the wrong side with the fans. He should have been on the prelims and this result would have been much greater. But like you have, um, you have him opening up the main card over some of the other great fights that we saw at the bottom. I I, I think they kind of did a disservice to him by by putting him on the main card, and it, mm -hmm. and it showed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was Kayla Good Harrison. It was yeah. Kayla Harrison's spot, in my opinion. You should have swapped those two fights. Mm -hmm. Goes any more leftovers? Uh, the gloves. You know, you want to see a sport be proactive all the time. Um, like too much time. Too much time went by. I like that they're finally addressing the gloves, and hopefully, it works out. I thought Bruce Buffer should have said Jim fucking Miller. Um, it, it doesn't take anything away from Bruce. I wouldn't have thought less than him. I really was holding my breath. I thought he was going to say it, but he didn't say it. Then I was hoping if Miller came back and won, that Bruce would reconsider and then announce his name as Jim fucking Miller. Didn't happen. Anything less? Anything more from Mike Bond? 
No, nah, not really. Um, I just props to everyone on the team for uh, working hard over this UFC 300 week. It was a absolutely uh, aggressive media schedule. All 26 fighters at media day and the press conference and everything. Haven't seen much like that. So I appreciate, you know, everyone who uh, not only followed us throughout the week, but, you know, the kind words about the bonuses and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it means a lot. And everyone here at the site appreciates the support out there. Mm -hmm. And most of all, thanks to you all for tuning in, for being readers of the site, listeners of st Spinning Back Click, the, the podcast, following us on social media. We do it all for you guys to provide you guys the best content in mixed martial arts. If you can hit the like button and the subscribe button on the way out. And don't forget, we're on TikTok now. We have Instagram, this YouTube channel, obviously, Facebook, we're everywhere. So many different ways for that. You know, some people are all about this social media platform, but not that one. We're just here to let you know that we're on all of them. And uh, I think we do the best job in all of mixed martial arts. And we'll see you all next Monday for another edition of Spinning Back Click. We'll be back to our normal start time of 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Go out and be a champion. We'll talk to you soon.